Hello, everyone, and welcome to Detect and Protect, the Australian Biosecurity Podcast. This podcast series is all about sharing information about biosecurity in Australia and the difference that this makes to our daily lives. My name is Steve Payos, host of the podcast, and in today's episode, we'll be discussing Australia's biosecurity system and why it is so important for our country. We'll be discussing some of our biosecurity challenges, including the growing pest and disease risk that we're facing and we'll also chat about the opportunities that we have to address these challenges and to further strengthen our biosecurity system. Joining me today is a very special guest, Mr. Andrew Tung, PSM. He is the Deputy Secretary of Biosecurity and Compliance at the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. Andrew, my absolute pleasure to have you today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, Steve. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, looking forward to a great chat with you today, Andrew. As I mentioned, we'll be talking about all of those uh, wonderful issues about biosecurity. We'll also be talking about challenges and innovation. And I also want to touch on you know, a very important document as well, which is Australia's strategic roadmap for protecting uh, Australia's environment, economy and the way of life. It has some great figures in there and some great information to really educate uh, the po- public and the population about why biosecurity is so important. Uh, first of all, Andrew, uh, how are you today? Everything's going well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Biosecurity keeps me fresh. It does. <laughs> that's good. That's good. An experienced campaigner like yourself, that's what we want to hear. Uh, Andrew, from your point of view, uh, if you could just explain for us, uh, why is biosecurity so important for Australia in your own words? So I could quote a lot of numbers at you. You know, the, the biosecurity system is a wor- worth about $300 billion. That's the, the asset that is the biosecurity system. For me, it turns on something that the people I work with talk about a lot. Um, the, the people that uh, the public meet at airports or when they're travelling internationally or might, um, might see in the media... They talk about protecting our way of life. And I think the reason they do that is biosecurity protects what is Australia. It protects the natural world. It protects agriculture. It protects jobs and livelihoods. And, you know, for individual members of the public, you can't go for a picnic if um, red imported fire ant means that your kids are going to get bitten with a horribly sharp bite. You won't go for a picnic. Um, bees, nobody takes, everybody sort of thinks bees are about honey. Um, bees are actually about pollination. You don't get fruit if you don't have bees. Well, you know, part of our job is to stop a thing called the varroa mite coming to Australia because it's a thing that will kill all our bees. And so for me, there's so much that we take for granted. Um, we've got a precious, fragile continent that we're trying to defend and protect from pests and diseases from the rest of the world. And that, for me, turns on way of life. I think it's about protecting all the things that Australians value about being Australians in our wonderful continent. And flowing on from that, Andrew, there's been a lot of prominence about this, you know, recently at federal government level and also throughout the department. It's becoming an issue that's synonymous with everybody now. So uh, I'm not going to say that it shouldn't have you know, taking the amount of time that it has. But it's fantastic from my point of view to see the importance placed on this and this actually getting the credit that it deserves and people actually being visible to those issues. And it's actually going further than what you say about the day-to-day about the people on the border and, you know, basic imports and exports or, as my father would say from his days back in primary industries here, you know, it was just the basics of money in, money out, products in, products out. There's so much more to it. So is there any reason that you think in particular why it's become more prominent or is it just an issue? that Australians are taking a lot more of a view on? So the government's given us uh, $400 million to invest in the biosecurity system. And the reason that's occurred is um, our threat environment's changing. And um, once Australia was protected from a biosecurity point of view because it was a long way from anywhere, well, we're not a long way from anywhere anymore. That's very true. Um, And... It's a combination of growth, you know, number of people in Australia. We're sucking in more imports. It's changing global trading patterns. It's um, climatic change, which is changing the host range of pests and diseases. And all that's come together. And what we've really put to the government and they've accepted is uh, we're in a different operating environment now. 
and and you know we we've really got to change how we deliver biosecurity and engage the public more. Uh, otherwise, we're at risk of getting some really serious pest and disease incursions in Australia that can fundamentally change agriculture, fundamentally affect the environment, and really begin to undermine many of the things we take for granted under the heading of our way of life. Speaking about some of those interceptions and, and pest risks that we've had of late, um, we've had some significant and disease interceptions you know, of yeah. late. Can you tell us a little bit about those uh, and also what the challenges are to our biosecurity system um, that we've had to face recently? Because I know of a couple of fantastic mm. ones, but please mm. tell us all about it. So I've got a couple that I'd like to talk about, Steve. One involves African swine fever. So African swine fever, naturally enough, is a, is a disease of pigs. We have about 4 million farm pigs in Australia and we have millions and millions of feral pigs. Um, we're African swine fever free, yet African swine fever is in Papua New Guinea, so four kilometres from the northernmost point of Australia, um, and it's in many countries that we trade with. Um, we've... Government's given us money to address the threat of African swine fever. Since November 2018, we've seized more than 50 tonnes of pork products out of wow. the passenger stream and the mail stream, so out of international mail and international passengers. And don't forget in 2019, because of COVID, not a lot of people travelled. Yep. Um, and when we sample what we're finding in the mail or, or from passengers... Sometimes up to 20 to 30 percent of what we of the samples we take show evidence of fragments of African swine fever, and I find that pretty amazing. I find you know 11 tons of pork products out of mail, out of international mail, and we sam we take samples out of those products, and 20 to up to 30 percent have evidence of African swine fever. You know, it's us doing our job, but I think it's pretty worrying. You know. Um, and the four million farm pigs in Australia, they support a lot of jobs. They support a lot of livelihoods. A lot of good Australians get up every day and go to work, and that can all be taken away if this disease comes into Australia. My other example involves uh, a thing called the capra beetle. Um, uh, Mr Brett Burdett, who lives in Canberra, contacted us and highlighted that um, he found some larvae in some fridge packaging, of all things. And when we investigated, it was a capra beetle larvae. Capra beetle is a storage pest. So if um, Australia had capra beetle, the value of our grain crop, we've just had one of our biggest grain crops ever, $16 billion worth of, of export opportunity for the Australian economy. That value halves or almost falls to zero. If we could sell it, it would halve. Um, and, and Mr Burdett, as, as a aware member of the public, highlighted the existence of this. When we tracked it back, a load of fridges from Thailand in a container that had spent time in Africa some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and what had happened, the capra beetle larvae live under the floor of the container, in the dirty underfloor area of the container. They can stay dormant for up to eight years. Fantastic. Something wakes yeah. them up. They migrate into the packaging. They really, because they're a storage pest like rice, and a lot of packaging is made with rice-based glue. And they chew away on that, and then we unpack the container in Australia. And, and so we've found um, that with both uh, fridges and, um, and some baby high chairs. Um, so those two examples, you know, that's two in the last 12 months that had potentially really serious consequences mm. for agricultural industries, for our economy, uh, and for people's jobs and the communities in which they live. I'm so glad you've touched on that, Andrew, because that was one thing where you've just gone in to explain mm. that, that, that circumstance of yeah. the public helping the public. I mean, we, we are the public service, of yeah. course, and we look yeah. after the people when it comes to this specific yeah. element of the government, but it's the public out there knowing what to look for and all of that sort of thing as well. So is there a specific message on top of Mr Burdett's story that you'd like to give to the public? Because this is one thing that we want to do as well when we talk about sharing information with the people and educating everybody about it is that important role that they can play and how important that is, especially in this case of carpal beetle. Um, look, I, I think the key message is it's a big continent. 
uh, and um, the pest and disease pressure. I describe it as pest and disease pressure. The pests and Absolutely. diseases that just want to come to Australia because that's how it works. Um, we can work as hard as we can, but we need the public engaged. We need 24 million sets of eyeballs helping us. And if we get the 24 million sets of eyeballs, we can continue to protect Australia from pests and diseases. Uh, if we don't, it just makes it harder. And we're going to, basically, the money the government's given us, the $400 million, is to change how we deliver biosecurity, to create what I call defence in depth, to help us protect the continent and the people and the jobs and the environment and agriculture. Um, so, yeah, look, it's really important that the public buy into biosecurity. I know the public gets lots of messages about all the things that they should be participating in. Um, this is a biggie. You know, um, and it's and it's really important that people pay attention, not buy food from overseas unless they know they're getting it from a reputable supplier who has a permit from us. Not trying to get around the system because they really, really want a cutting from the old country. Those sorts of things. It just it's not okay. Livelihoods and jobs depend on the biosecurity. And it's so great to see the awareness of this growing. As I mentioned at the start of our chat today, the awareness of this is growing and it's, it's becoming very common in people's, in their faces for people to see and get an understanding of what to do, which is something that is very impressive to me and something that I'm finding is becoming more popular as well. I mean, you sort of, some people traditionally think of that import space, export space, a lot of things like guns and drugs and all of the, the fancier stuff, but the effects of this, and that's not taking anything away from those elements, yeah. the effects, as you mentioned, in dollar terms and the effect that will have on people's livelihoods, you know, what we can eat, how we can live is absolutely massive. Moving on from that, Andrew, uh, and just quickly with that, I'm glad you raised the dormancy issue of the carpet yeah. beetle as well, yeah. because I mean, I know I'd love to have an eight year sleep sometimes, <laughs> but, but we don't quite get uh, that luxury. But that's that's the thing to remember is that a lot of these bugs, whether it's BMSB or carpet beetle, yeah. they remain dormant for a long time. They, they, they spark up out of nowhere sometimes. We don't exactly know why. Um, well, we do know why, but it's it's varied as to, as to the reasons yeah. When yeah. uh, and because of that, it's something we need to keep our eyes on. So, for all of our listeners out there, please remember: if you see anything odd, you see anything strange in your backyard, in your house, in any new products that you've purchased, make sure you're keeping your eyes on that. Yeah. Moving forward, Andrew, a very interesting uh, time is ahead of us at the moment. We've just yeah. been struck down by a pandemic over the last 18 months, and Australia has remained very staunch uh, with our with our view on that and, and, and being careful with what happens and the interests into our country, which I think is very, very important. Touching on this document that I referenced before, our biosecurity roadmap, there's some really important things here that I'd like to touch on, and I'd love for you to expand on them. Uh, my question is around the main challenges for our system over the next five to 10 years, and I note in this document, that we really heavily talk about things like climate change, mm -hmm. uh, global disruptions, illegal activity, exotic pests and diseases mm -hmm. arriving, and also greater volumes and more complex supply chains like you've yeah. talked about in there as well is also unexpected things like a pandemic at the moment. So yeah. please, Andrew, uh, if you could expand on that, our main challenges over the next five to 10 years and how we're looking at factoring in all of those pressures on the system moving sure. forward. Sure. So um, we, we've got a range of key challenges. One is, I uh, mentioned volume. So we deal with about 2.4 million or so containers coming to Australia every year. That's just going to grow. Um, the number of containers coming to Australia grows at a faster rate than the economy grows, <laughs> believe it or not. It's I'm incredible talking. figures. It, yeah, it really is. Yeah, and, um, and every one of those containers, because of this dormancy issue and um, it's something we're quite concerned about, can um, contain any one of 14 hitchhiker pests that we worry about. We call them hitchhikers, um, but, but they can be brown marmorated stink bug, capra beetle, so and so on. Um, so volume is a concern. Um, the complexity of where trade is coming from, global supply chains are very integrated and, you know, you might think that it, it's a toy that's made in, I'll pick somewhere, somewhere in Asia, um, but it might have components that come from other places in the world, the packaging might be sourced from somewhere in the world, the containers coming from somewhere else, the ship that it's on, mm -hmm. even the ship, we look at the ship. They have to, the we vessel, that's right. We look at about right. 20,000 vessel movements a year. And our, and our great staff are interacting with many of those vessels. 
Um, we've found vessels that have brought um, um, bees with them that we don't have in Australia. And that's where the Varroa mite that I mentioned comes in. So where are vessels coming from? Um, what we call natural pathways. Um, so there's a thing called the fall army worm. It just blew in on the wind. Um, Literally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it can fly 100 more, more kilometres a night. Um, and it basically was detected on Thursday Island and 12 months later it was at Eden. Um, and so there's natural pathways into Australia. Some of the money the government's given us will enable us to work more closely with countries in our region. If we're going to be a really good neighbour with countries in our region, we have to help them have strong biosecurity systems and their strength is our strength and vice versa. So that's very important. So that will be a capacity building aspect that we have in, as responsible yeah. biosecurity citizens. I know that that's in right. my specific work area where I work in compliance partnerships, we have a heavy focus on capacity building, on teaching yeah. them how to yeah. manage their systems appropriately as well. So that must be an opportunity for yeah, us as well. It's a, it's a huge opportunity for us as an organisation, but for us as a country, um, being a good neighbour has a real payback, mm. you know, and so doing some work there. Um, the story of volume, complexity, climate change. Um, listeners may have heard of a thing called the brown dog tick and a disease called ehrlichiosis. Um, once um, that disease wouldn't have got further south in the Tropic of Capricorn as a result of a warming climate in Australia, that disease would probably now get to Adelaide. And if things continue on their path, it'll probably get to Melbourne. Yeah. Left untreated, dogs die. Yeah. Um, and so it can, the disease can be treated, but it's one more thing, you know, that we have to manage. But let's also make the point there as well, Andrew, that that has, for example, for those that are dog lovers or have pets in their yeah. families, these are the things that really affect your day-to-day -day life. And I mean, I know there's these broader issues that we talk about here with, with economy and figures and, 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 our, and our primary produce, but there's an example where it actually affects your day-to-day, -day, where things like that, well, what could be so innocuous, will have a really hard effect on your family. Exactly. Exactly, and that's why I come back to way of life. If we um, don't focus on these issues, we'll turn around one day and everything that we take for granted that's precious and special about Australia, um, many aspects of it might not be there. Um, so there's a story of volume, complexity, change, um, and all of that happening at one time. So it's kind of, it's built up, and now what we're facing is a big shift of gear. Um, so there's a few diseases poised to our north that we're particularly worried about. Uh, African horse sickness, lumpy skin disease, which is a cattle disease. I've mentioned African swine fever. Rabies is mm -hmm. to our north. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's some bad gear, and that's before we get to foot and mouth disease. Um, and in, you know, some of our sampling, we've even found fragments of foot and mouth disease, just a couple. How much does that, if I can just quickly ask there, how much does that scare us? I mean, I know, for example, I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of conjecture in the media. I'm just trying to make a quick yeah. uh, relationship here with the way that COVID-19 has been. You see headlines yeah. that it's been found in the fragments, it's been found in the wastewater. It's obviously very serious when you know that something is there and there's remnants of something and that's existed. So yeah. how much does that, uh, I'm not sure scare you is the right word, but how much does that put you on alert, noting that we're finding these things in, in certain elements of places where we might not thought they'd be? Yeah, uh, look, uh, good point. Um, it, it does. It does point to the fact that our risk profile's changed. Yeah. And events that we might have thought once were highly unlikely with massive consequences are becoming rather more likely with even, even more bigger massive, consequences. With even bigger yep. consequences. Yep. And so hence the, the federal government's investment. We're going to be working with our state and territory colleagues to develop a national biosecurity strategy. Excellent. The reason we need a national biosecurity strategy is biosecurity isn't about just what the Commonwealth does. Um, states and territories historically um, and continue to have a very big role in the biosecurity system because they're managing the endemic pests and weeds that, you know, you can read in the newspaper, mice in New South Wales and fruit fly in South Australia. The states and territories have a huge role and then industry and the community have a big role. Um, and so what's the nation's path forward? The nation's path forward is to build defence in depth, mm -hmm. to 
starting overseas before goods have even left. Talk about this, Andrew, if you don't mind, please, those three levels we have of our defence system because that's a key component in this document. Have a look, as I mentioned, in the link to this podcast. But, Andrew, please go on and talk about that because in here we talk about those three lines of biosecurity defence. So please go on. Yeah, sure. So um, it's it's really important that we have a view uh, before goods, people, objects, ships, planes leave about their biosecurity status. And some of that is handrolic. It's about what people do. It's about what our staff do. It's about how we're working. A lot of it's to do with data and analytics, and we've been received a big investment to improve our understanding of the world around us from a biosecurity point of view. Um, you know, like we need a view on where of any one of the containers coming to Australia been in the last eight years. Yeah. That's actually a big challenge. Yeah. So that's that kind of pre-border view, working with our near neighbours, building their strength to deal with biosecurity. Then there's what's happening at the border. Uh, and that's the traditional role that I'm sure many listeners are familiar with, the old quarantine function. AQUIS, yeah. yeah the and old those. AQUIS. Yep. Um, well, the border's very different now. Um, and um, again, we're going to apply data and analytics, new technology. We've got a world first 3D X ray technology that we're starting to screen mail with. That's what's helping us find pork products through the mail. So we're going to change up the border. People will have a different experience over time. Our dogs are still there. Mm-hmm. You know, our dogs are they're fantastic. You know, if I could use this analogy, if your handkerchief was representative of what you can smell. A dog's nose would be like a tennis court. That's how good they are. And so we're going to have the latest tech alongside the dogs, you know, so we're going to double down. Um, And then post-border, there is our ability to detect and manage anything that might defeat us at the border or pre-border. The reason that's important, we'll be judged in international trading markets and in the international community about our ability to cauterise and contain anything that we that we think is a threat. And so that post-border area, working with our state and territory colleagues and industry, that's where we get our resilience from. That's where we get our ability to respond and bounce back and keep trading. And that's where we really get to the meat potatoes of protecting everything we take for granted about the Australian way of life. So those three levels, before the border, at the border, after the border, and they've all got to talk to one another. Mm. So hence the need for a national biosecurity strategy. And talking about that connection there, Andrew, if you don't mind, that role of the state and territories as well is very, very important. And having that on, I mean, as a, as a Commonwealth department, we're on the ground, of course, yeah. and then the state and territories have their role to play in that management on the ground too. So flowing on from what you're talking about there with those three pillars, yeah. is it fair to say you we've talked about the opportunities but when it comes to priorities if you could expand on that please because that's I I feel like this is a difficult one to answer but I'm going to throw you the difficult question because that's what we're here to do is to to tell the public you know how we feel and what we're thinking about the best way to manage this but priority wise getting that framework set up will be very important but what do you see as the priorities when it comes to not specifically the importance of the three layers because they're all just as important but what's the priority in actually attacking all of these threats and how we go about managing it from that whole point of view so there's a there's a couple of priorities that emerge out of all of this one is uh, the people priority um, and that's um, people in the organization that I'm part of it's people in state and territory agriculture departments or primary industries departments it's the public it's people in the industry and it's about awareness it's about the skills that we need to develop as a country to manage the threats that we face. Yeah. Um, And a lot of it is to do with communication. A lot of it is to do with ensuring that we all understand that the world's changed Mm -hmm. and everything that went before is not much of a guide to what's going to come next. So there's a people element. There's a partnerships element. Uh, So how do we protect a continent um, from... The size of ours as well. The size of ours with a small population. How do we do that? Well... A key way is partnerships, and it could be partnerships with Indigenous rangers in Northern Australia who are uh, setting fly traps and doing monitoring for us. It could be partnerships with particular agricultural industries. It could be partnerships with environment groups, 
partnerships with states and territories. You know, the, this notion that we've got to build partnerships and recognise that we might all play slightly different roles. Together we're strong, divided we're weak. It really is as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's a kind of technology element here. Um, we can use new technologies in ways that mean that we can do a much better job in sifting through the 77,000 combinations of goods and countries coming to Australia. I love these figures. I do. Um, It's just incredible. And and the the tens of millions of mail items, when travel returns post-COVID, hundreds of thousands of passengers, you know, every week, um, we can use technology in a different way. And we can use technology to be really smart. So one of the things we're working on um, is um, a fish identification app, believe it or not. Beautiful. Using our Nothing fish- surprises me anymore. It's, yeah. it's great. Yeah, and this, this is a clever piece of technology developed by inside the department um, in our supervising scientist branch in Darwin. It um, uses images of fish and artificial intelligence to detect what they are. Why would we care about fish? Well, the ornamental fish market in Australia is worth about $100 million. A lot of livelihoods attached to it. Yeah. We worry about fish because ornamental fish can bring diseases to Australia that we don't have in freshwater fish or saltwater fish. Um, so if we can use artificial intelligence, we can enable the import of exotic fish, um, but at the same time, we can keep f- fish species out that might carry risks for Australia. So there's lots of ways we can use technology. And then finally, um, for, for us, for agri- the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, large part of our biosecurity effort is cost recovered. And that means there's a payer, and the payer is usually in the agriculture sector. And uh, we need to do some further work about funding. Um, and that is, this is an expensive business to maintain. Um, in the four, in the next twelve months, it'll be we'll be spending in the order of, I guess, um, one point four million dollars a day just to run the biosecurity system at a Commonwealth level, um, and you know the taxpayer makes a big injection, industry makes an injection. Uh, we've got to do further work on how do we sustain that as a nation over time, over decades. Um, I think the continent's worth protecting. I think it's very precious and special. I reckon I've got 24 million people in agreement with me, uh, but we've got to fund it, and we've got to fund it for the long term. And the other thing we need to fund is the management of pests and diseases when they're here. Rabbits, mice, uh, weeds, you know, etc. cetera. Um, there's a payer always. And so continued long-term commitment in funding to the biosecurity system. So that'd be my four key elements. Fantastic. And talking about that, we, we know that prevention is greater than the cure all the time. So that's something that's very important to to give that information to our listeners and to the public is that we don't want to get in that response or management or recovery phase. It's about making sure that we're in prevention at all times and, and looking ahead to that. You gave I'll a, tell you a great story, Steve. Yeah. Sorry to no, interrupt. Please I'll tell do. you a great story. My favourite story is about the northernmost fly trap in Australia. Um, it's a fly trap that hangs on a mango tree on Saibai Island, four kilometres from the Papua New Guinea coast. It's tended by our staff in the, in the Torres Strait, um, local, local officers. Uh, and the reason that fly trap's important is it's intercepting flies that are coming down, particularly but not solely from Papua New Guinea. And some of those flies can really damage agriculture from Cape York all the way down in that kind of wet tropics zone, um, that fly trap gives a return of about 30 to 1. For every dollar we spend on it, it's saving $30. Incredible. And, that's and a I, return on investment, that right? Is a, that is a return on investment. If you could get that out of your, out of your share portfolio, you'd be, <laughs> you know, you'd be like Jeff Bezos. Um, and um, what it takes to sustain that fly trap involves staff on Saibai Island, planes, helicopters, entomologists, laboratories, the Australian Centre for Disease Prevention, our level four laboratory, there's a handful of them in the world at Geelong. It, it takes a huge effort to merely sustain it, but that fly trap, 30 bucks for every dollar we spend on it. Um, Incredible story. You know, they're yeah. not, that, that's not a bad, 
return on investment for our country. I reckon I can stand behind that and be accountable. Absolutely, and a lot of the a lot of the money that we're putting in is seeing these benefits. When we talk about the figures here that you just mentioned about yeah. those protection figures, yeah. I want to touch on as well. You gave a great example then on innovation yeah. and how important that is. So what I don't want to do here is ask the dumb question about how important innovation is, uh, because we all know that it's the way that the world is moving. We know how big of a role that technology is playing. But what I do want to speak about, Andrew, and ask you is where do you see innovation evolving over the next five to ten years we're talking about things like apps now the x-ray technology you've talked about as well and i know that's a little bit of an open air question because the future is changing so rapidly now but how do you see that innovation evolving over the next five to ten years for us to be able to help our biosecurity system help our partners and and plan for the future beyond for example this report and the information where we talk about beyond 2030 so I, I see innovation affecting every area of biosecurity. Um, there's new technologies emerging in our application of science. We're a huge public sector employer of scientists. Um, the government give, has given us money for new scientific equipment. And the key there, the innovation there is the equipment being connected effectively to the cloud. And um, us being able to make really rapid identification of things that we find at the border mm -hmm. so that we know what we're dealing with so we can transmit that to industry and to states and territories and say, we're seeing this and we know 100% it looks like that. Um, so I see real innovation in science, mm -hmm. real innovation in our ability to, to conduct surveillance. There's 10,000 kilometres of coastline in northern Australia in working with Indigenous ranger groups up there, but we can put new, cheap, but very effective tech in their hands um, and we'll be able to do a much better job at surveilling that 10,000 kilometres of coastline and all the country, sea country, country behind the coast that we need to monitor. Um, I see innovation in how people move through airports. We're working with the new Western Sydney Airport about what will biosecurity look like at that airport when it opens? You know, it'll be a different experience. We're working with New Zealand on um, new algorithms, new X-ray technologies. How can we work together to share information? We're putting um, special computer glasses uh, with our staff so that a staff member can be inspecting a container and somebody in another, in a capital city somewhere, can be looking at those images. We can collect those images and put them in the cloud and run artificial intelligence over. It's the amazing. Country. This reminds me of Arnold Schwarzenegger movies yeah. in the mid nineties with the glasses <laughs> and have, have yeah, the one one right. window and somebody watching it. But that's that's magnificent. So all all we're starting, we're doing it. Like yeah. we're working on some of these things. Is there a relationship there as well with the ICT sector then, and how important that is with our our department where we talk about? Because I know cloud is a, is a it's the way of the future, is what I understand from people I know in that industry. So this type of stuff where we must obviously be seeing an investment in ICT as well to be able to transmit this information to the cloud, to be able to get it to people and scientists to look at straight away. Yeah, look, one of the things that the government's invested in in the recent budget is our maritime arrival and reporting system. Mm. That's the system that helps us manage all the vessels coming to mm -hmm. Australia. So we're going to be... Famous Mars. Famous oh, Mars. Why. We're going to yeah, be upgrading our maritime arrival and reporting system, extending its operation doing a better job at sharing information out of that system with our partners in state government and in ports. Um, over time, we will build that system out and we will add imagery of vessels and imagery of containers and we will start to do all this data and analytics over the top that allows us to build better risk profiles of everything that's coming towards Australia. And, you know, that's where innovation takes us. Frankly, there are just so many possibilities that come, that out there. It comes back to your earlier question about where's the priority. Well, early on, um, we've set priorities. We know what we need to do in mail. We know what we need to do for passengers. We think we can get on top of air cargo using this new tech. Uh, we've got to move to shipping containers. And sea cargo, of course. Sea cargo, mm. you know, that's a, that's a big area for us. But even there. We're out scanning the world for technologies that might help us. I guess your, your point about the ICT sector, uh, we are open for ideas. We are open for clever things that anybody listening might want to chip in to help us sift through 
all the things that are coming to Australia, things and people and craft and conveyances um, to help keep us biosecure. And touching on that as well, I know that we've had uh, a lot of fantastic submissions and also fantastic uh, businesses and entrepreneurial actions from a lot of the people out there that have that have come to us with proposals under our innovation network and the scheme, which has seen an expansion in our in our relationships with you know with the private sector as well to go ahead and do this. And by having you know senior executives such as yourself with that open mind is what we need to actually progress this and get these things out there and and working on a day to day basis. So that's that's a huge hugely popular thing I see there as well is that um, our wonderful men and women at the top of this department are doing such a great job in expanding your own horizons to go you know what things do change let's get this on board. Yeah look I think it's um, it's a real challenge earlier in my uh, career I was responsible for the aviation security system and even in the sort of decade since I last did that you know the technology's advanced um, the, our ability to analyse and collect data is advanced and we have to be open um, and I can't s- stress enough how much we as Australians tend to take what we have for granted. Yeah. You know, yeah. we Donald Horn was right, we are a lucky country but we have to work to make our own luck going. And to keep it that way, of course, as well. And to keep it that way. And to keep it that way. A couple of last ones here, Andrew. Fantastic chat so far. Uh, We really appreciate your time. Uh, I want to talk about, you started uh, referencing our international partners as well a moment ago. So I'd just like to to talk to you about how we're utilising our relationships with those partners to ensure that we manage those biosecurity risks. And I know that, for example, uh, as I mentioned before, the section that I work in has a huge focus on international capacity building and improving the strength of biosecurity systems and, and sharing sharing information as well. I mean, we recently had a, a quarantine regulators meeting with, you know, over over 30 agencies and 800 delegates that all came in virtually, of course, because of, of the world that we're living in. But that ability to share information and have them ask questions of us as, as a biosecurity expert, I think is something that, you know, we're really proud of. But in your opinion, what, what is the things that we're doing to to help those relationships, to, to, to use those relationships in our favour and also help our partners to manage biosecurity? So one of the things we're doing is we're setting ourselves to work with our um, Pacific neighbours and and friends to develop a Pacific biosecurity strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason that's important, um, the pests and diseases that hurt Australia can also hurt Pacific Island nations. You know, there's um, um, animal diseases that kill coconuts and, you know, no coconut trees on a tropical island seems like a bad thing. Um, African swine fever. Pigs are important in many Pacific Island cultures. African swine fever will kill the pigs. Uh, And so there's a real opportunity there for us to bring not just what we at the Commonwealth know, but particularly what our colleagues at state and territories know about biosecurity, to work with partners in the region to support them and build skills and capability. Um, The other point I'd make is that Biosecurity is governed globally by a set of international organisations. Mm-hmm. Um, and the OIE, which is the World Organisation for Animal Welfare, which was recently chaired by Dr Mark Ship, our Chief Vet, Australia's Chief Vet that I work with very closely, International Plant Protection Organisation, which we're represented on by Dr Gabrielle Vivian Smith, who is our Chief Plant Protection Officer. Um, so there's international organisations and structures that we can work with and then we, those are broken down into regional groupings. So again, we're going to put more effort into those organisations, more effort into talking about how the spread of pests and diseases affects every country, not just Australia, every country. Um, and we're going to try and be a really good neighbour and friend in our own part of the world. That's, you know... and. We certainly received investment. I think there's more we can do. I think it'll create exciting opportunities for people working in biosecurity. And I think it'll create exciting opportunities for people in the region. That's fantastic, mate. It really is. It's, it's a hugely, hugely important area and something that I know that we're, we've used and often prided ourselves on being mm-hmm. those great educators and, and being there for our counterparts to, to help us in that system. Uh, one more thing, please, Andrew. Uh, it's been a magnificent chat, one that I've really enjoyed. Uh, what is your take-home message to our listeners today and our audience? Now, there's been so many of them today. It's you know, I've written down a million of them, but if there is a, a single take-home message, as hard as that might be, what is that? Um, Australia is um, a 
beautiful but fragile climate. And biosecurity contributes really significantly to protecting it. And we need everybody. We need every single Australian buying into the importance of biosecurity. Because uh, we've only got one continent, uh, and if we don't protect Australia from pests and disease, many of the things we take for granted uh, can go. And once they're gone, we won't get them back. Yeah. And so um, it's, it's really, I can't stress enough, the world has changed. Everything that we all thought we knew about our place in the world is being challenged, at least in terms of biosecurity. And so I just ask people to buy in, even, even if buying in means not buying sausages from overseas, even if buying in just means keeping their eyes peeled and making a phone call or sending us an email, even if buying in just means being conscious when you travel again, you know, when we can all travel again, not bring dirty boots when you've been on a farm somewhere, back into the country, not taking a cutting from a friend's garden and trying to smuggle it back in. Because your success in beating us at the border is going to destroy jobs and livelihoods. That is un-Australian. That is. That is, is. un-Australian. That is not who we are. So I just ask people to buy in, please, um, because failure to has some pretty damning consequences for our beautiful, beautiful continent. And some dire consequences they would be. So magnificent, Andrew. Thank you very much for that. My take home listeners on that is to make sure that you are as invested in this as you are with anything in your daily life as a traveler coming back into the country, as someone who's importing, exporting, buying things, involved in that industry. And don't forget, it affects everything that we do, whether that's eating, drinking, pets, your day-to-day life, Andrew. It's everything that we do is it affects the biosecurity system. So make sure you keep a strong focus on that. Andrew, I would like to say on behalf of myself and our producers, a very big thank you for joining us on the podcast series. Uh, the series has been so informative and it's flying at the moment. So we really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us. Uh, thank you very much again. And, and hopefully we can get you back on you know, in, in three to six months to talk about the next challenges after that. Great. Thanks very much for your time, Steve. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, something that's so important to our country. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's great to have our senior executive uh, available for the public as well, listeners. So that is something that's very important to us is knowing that they're there, they're available, and and there are wonderful faces uh, to all the work that we do here as a government organisation. Thanks again, Andrew. Thank you very much to all of our listeners for tuning into our podcast today. You can find more information on Australian biosecurity on the department's website. Links will be available in the episode description below. So have a look. We'll also have our Commonwealth Biosecurity 2030 roadmap some more information about that as well so make sure you subscribe to our podcast series to keep up to date and learn more about australian biosecurity thanks very much to our producers shane faulkner sam mckean as always my name is steve payos and we'll see you on the next episode of detect and protect